The most ambitious steam engine of its era wasn't just heavy. It was a rolling catastrophe, crushing every bridge unlucky enough to lie in its path. Designed to lead the world, it caused seven collapses, millions in losses, and forced an industry to rewrite the rules. How could the world's most promising locomotive become its greatest disaster? The story behind the steam engine. So heavy it broke, every bridge begins with a single, irresistible idea and ends with a trail of ruin that changed railway history forever. By the closing decades of the 19th century, the world's railways had become a proving ground for industrial ambition. Across Britain, the United States, and continental Europe, railway companies competed for headlines and contracts by promising faster trains, heavier loads, and record-breaking feats of engineering. Newspapers ran full-page adverts boasting about the longest express, the most powerful engine, or the greatest haulage ever attempted. Executives and designers alike believed that the path to profit and prestige lay in building bigger, stronger, and faster machines, each one outdoing the last. Railway boards poured money into new workshops, lured by the idea that a single, giant locomotive could pull twice the freight with half the crew. Engineering journals of the era chronicled this arms race, with companies touting their latest experiments in size and speed, sometimes before a single bolt had been tested under real-world conditions. The public, swept up in the excitement, packed platforms to glimpse these mechanical giants as they rumbled through towns, their sheer scale a symbol of modern progress. Beneath this optimism, a quieter reality took shape. With every new design, the pressure to deliver results mounted. Safety codes were sparse and enforcement weaker still. Trial and error was not just accepted, it was expected. Designers relied on calculations, intuition, and the hope that the next leap forward would hold together when metal met track. The lack of standardized testing meant that many engines rolled out of the factory with little more than a handshake and a promise. Contests to set records became routine. In some years, rival companies would unveil dueling prototypes within months of each other, each engine heavier and more powerful than the last. The headlines celebrated these achievements, rarely pausing to ask whether the bridges and rails beneath could bear the load. For the men at the drawing boards, the only real failure was to be outdone by a competitor. In this climate, restraint was a foreign word and the temptation to push limits, sometimes blindly, was impossible to resist. The stage was set for invention on a scale the world had never seen and for consequences no one was prepared to face. Ambitious Blueprints On a rain-soaked morning in 1899, the chief designer of the Midland and Northern Railway arrived at the company's headquarters with a set of blueprints that promised to change railroading forever. The design was as bold as the era demanded, a steam locomotive projected to weigh 85 tons, dwarfing every rival on the company roster. Minutes from the board meeting that followed captured the mood. Directors signed their approval with a flourish. Convinced this machine would secure their place at the forefront of industrial progress. Massive power. The vision called for a locomotive with a boiler so large it spanned nearly the entire length of the frame feeding a bank of cylinders designed to double the hauling power of any predecessor. The wheel plan was a marvel of complexity. Ten driving axles arranged to spread the load, a feat few had dared attempt. The blueprints detailed a firebox wide enough to burn coal at a rate that would have seemed reckless just a decade earlier. Every element was superlative. Thicker steel plates, reinforced frames, and a cab built for two crews to work in shifts, should the engine ever run the length of the line without stopping. 85. The designer's notes, preserved in the company archives, reflected a rare confidence. Calculations filled the margins. Axle loads, projected tractive effort, the precise volume of water and coal required for a day's run. The 85-ton target appeared on every page, circled, 
and underlined, a number that would soon become infamous. Engineering journals of the time published early sketches, marveling at the ambition. Letters between the chief designer and his opposite numbers at rival firms reveal a sense of pride, even rivalry, as each tried to outdo the other in scale and power. Full steam. With board approval secured, the workshops began work on the prototype. Steel shipments arrived by the ton, and the foundry worked overtime to cast the massive driving wheels. The optimism was infectious. Newspapers reported on the project with breathless anticipation, and even skeptical engineers conceded that, on paper, the numbers seemed to add up. For a brief moment, the promise of progress felt unstoppable. And the only question left was how soon the world would see the behemoth in motion. The first hint of disaster appeared not on the rails, but in the workshop ledger, when the finished locomotive rolled onto the company's massive weighing scale. The chief engineer recorded the number in his logbook with a heavy hand. 127 tons fully loaded. That figure landed like a thunderclap. The target had been 85 tons, already an ambitious leap. But somewhere along the line, nearly 42 tons had slipped through the calculations. Hidden in thicker steel, oversized castings, and most of all, the water required to fill the enormous boiler. The design notes had accounted for the dry weight, but the true mass of water, over 20 tons, had been treated almost as an afterthought. In an era when most engines weighed less than 70 tons, this new machine was off the scale, both literally and figuratively. The chief engineer's diary, preserved in the archives, captured the shock. The numbers cannot be denied. We have built a colossus. It is heavier than any bridge on our lines has ever been asked to bear. Workshop staff whispered about the reading, but the pressure to deliver was unrelenting. With the official unveiling days away, there was no time for re-engineering or public second thoughts. The directors, eager for headlines, ordered the, engine, ordered the engine steamed and ready for its first demonstration run. As the locomotive hissed and rumbled to life, the weight of oversight and of hundreds of tons of steel and water was about to be tested not by theory, but by the very rails and bridges it was meant to conquer. Hundreds gathered along the embankment, umbrellas pressed tight against the drizzle as the locomotive approached Blackwater Bridge for its inaugural crossing. The air was thick with anticipation. Railway officials and local dignitaries watched from the safety of the platform, while reporters scribbled notes for the morning papers. The engine rolled forward at a cautious crawl, its weight pressing into the rails with a force no one present had ever witnessed. As the first set of driving wheels touched the iron latticework, a deep groan echoed from beneath the deck, metal straining under a burden it was never meant to bear. A hush fell over the crowd as the engine edged further onto the span. Then a sharp, unnatural crack rang out, followed by a chorus of twisting, wrenching noises. The bridge sagged visibly at its center. According to the Manchester Guardian, the spectacle was like watching a cathedral collapse. In an instant, the entire central section gave way. The locomotive lurched violently, its front wheels dropping into the void as the bridge folded beneath it. A plume of steam burst from the ruptured pipes, and the shriek of tearing metal drowned out the cries of onlookers. Miraculously, the crew in the cab escaped with bruises and shock. But the pride of the railway lay half-submerged in the river, tangled in the wreckage of iron and timber. Officials rushed to cordon off the site, but the damage was done. Word of the disaster spread by telegraph and headline, and by nightfall the story of Blackwater Bridge had eclipsed every other topic in the city. For the first time, the promise of progress had given way to public doubt, and the need for answers became impossible to ignore. Engineers gathered at the wreckage, 
notebooks in hand as the rain continued to fall. The numbers told a story as clear as the twisted iron beneath their boots. The locomotive's weight, once spread over ten axles in theory, pressed down on the bridge in ways no calculation had truly captured. Instead of a gentle distribution, the real burden fell on just a few points at a time. Institution of Mechanical Engineers, papers from the period, warned of this exact danger. Concentrated axle loads could double the expected stress on a single bridge section. And then there was the hammer blow effect. Each revolution of the massive wheels sent a jolt through the rails, multiplying the force far beyond the static weight. Every crossing became a gamble, the pounding rhythm of the engine shaking bolts loose and opening hairline cracks with every pass. Emergency crews worked through the night, bracing the ruined span with hastily cut timber and iron straps. The railway company ordered similar reinforcements at every bridge along the road, hoping to buy time. Teams added extra trusses and laid heavy timbers beneath the rails, but these fixes only masked the problem. Temporary bans followed, first on the most fragile crossings, then on entire stretches of track. Each attempted solution came with its own cost, delays, rerouted trains, and mounting frustration among the men who had built their reputations on progress. The chief engineer's diary grew more desperate by the day. Lighter wheels were proposed, boiler insulation stripped away. Even the frame itself was pared down, yet the engine remained a colossus. The science was clear. No amount of patchwork could save a project that defied the limits of physics and material. And with every failed fix, the shadow of wider destruction crept further down the line. Within weeks of the first collapse, the story along the 30-mile corridor turned grim. Seven bridges, each meant to anchor the region's prosperity, lay twisted or condemned, their ironwork buckled by the same relentless weight. Local newspapers filled with accounts of stranded freight, empty platforms, and shopkeepers staring at unsold goods. Municipal ledgers from towns like Eastfield and Marston recorded the sudden drop in market receipts and the spike in relief payments for out-of-work porters, carters, and innkeepers. The railway's repair crews worked around the clock, but every new crossing brought fresh disaster. Timber and iron vanished from local yards, snapped up for emergency repairs. Temporary ferries and wagons clogged muddy roads that had never seen such traffic. The financial toll mounted with each span lost. Company accountants, tallying the cost of wreckage, rerouted trains and lost cargo estimated the damage at nearly $3 million in today's terms. That sum did not include the compensation demanded by town councils or the lawsuits filed by merchants whose shipments had spoiled on sidings. The railway's promise of progress had turned to hardship for entire communities. Boardroom pressure grew fierce as the directors faced angry letters from mayors, ruined contracts, and the threat of regulatory action. For the families along the line, the disaster was measured in missed pay, shuttered shops, and the echo of empty tracks. The engine, once a symbol of ambition, had left a trail of broken bridges and broken livelihoods. Each failed crossing brought more than structural ruin. It severed the economic lifelines of the towns it was meant to serve. Inside the company boardroom, the mood had shifted from bravado to exhaustion. Stacks of repair invoices and angry letters from town councils covered the long table. The directors faced a choice, keep pouring money into a machine that had left a trail of ruin or admit defeat and cut their losses. The official minutes from the decisive meeting record the tension in the room. After hours of argument, the final vote was called. Six directors pressed for one last round of fixes, hoping to salvage something from the investment. Five, led by the finance officer and the company solicitor, demanded an immediate end. The motion to persevere failed by a single hand. The chairman, voice unsteady, read the final tally. By six votes to five, the board resolved to decommission the locomotive and begin arrangements for its disposal. 
the chief designer, whose calculations had once inspired such confidence, sat silent as the verdict was delivered. His private memo, later found among the archives, spoke of sleepless nights and a sense of personal ruin. He wrote that he had exhausted every possibility, that to admit defeat was unbearable, and that every crossing risked a greater tragedy. Within a week, workers drained the boiler, stripped the cab, and prepared the engine for its last journey, not to the rails, but to the scrapyard. The company ledger from that month lists the sale of steel plates and driving wheels, a somber inventory of ambition reduced to salvage. A handful of components, pressure gauges, a nameplate, were set aside for the company museum, reminders of a project that promised greatness, but delivered only caution. The rest, melted down and forgotten, left nothing but a line in the accounts and a warning in the engineer's hand. Never let pride outweigh the weight of steel. Within a year of the locomotive's downfall, the Board of Trade issued sweeping new rules for every railway in the country. No bridge could be approved for service without a physical load test using the heaviest engine intended for the line and inspectors now demanded axle-by-axle -axle weight breakdowns before any new locomotive could leave the works. Design offices scrambled to recalculate their blueprints, as the days of handshake approvals and guesswork were over. Engineering journals published the updated testing protocols, dated March 1900, that set strict limits on axle loads and required real-world trials before public use. The era of unchecked ambition gave way to a new standard, Prove it or park it. Once celebrated in trade journals, the locomotive story took a sharp turn. Within a decade, engineering textbooks began referencing the case as a textbook warning, sometimes with a wry nod to the chief designer's once gilded reputation. One journal quipped that no man should weigh his fortune in water and steel alone. The failed engine became a fixture in classroom lectures, its blueprints dissected not for brilliance, but for oversight. University syllabi listed the incident alongside the D Bridge and Tay Bridge disasters, cementing its place in the educational canon. The legacy, intended as a marvel, survives as a lesson in humility. Engineering's lessons repeat across generations. In 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge twisted itself to pieces just four months after opening undone by forces its designers had not fully tested. A decade later, the de Havilland Comet jet suffered catastrophic failures when metal fatigue, invisible in calculations, tore open the sky. Each disaster began with confidence and ended with new rules, proving that unchecked ambition and untested design remain a universal risk. The official records show the locomotive's final measured weight at 127 tons, 42 tons, above its design target, seven collapses and losses, equivalent to $3 million forced the railway to scrap the engine after a narrow six to five board vote, as documented in company minutes and municipal reports. Despite extensive investigations, Original correspondence reveals that the precise cause of the weight overrun, whether a calculation flaw or a materials oversight, remains partially unresolved because key engineering logs are missing. What is certain is that the disaster led to immediate reforms. Board of Trade mandates in 1900 required real-world bridge load testing and set strict axle weight limits for all new locomotives. This event became a staple in engineering textbooks and is cited in Board of Trade archives as the turning point for railway safety standards. Today, the legacy of this failed engine endures as a factual warning. In engineering, unchecked ambition without thorough testing can leave a trail of irreversible consequences.